Shefa Dulani. I'm the founding partner and creative at Talented. I've had the incredible opportunity to represent Indian creativity at forums like Can Lion and DNAD uh, a whole host of times. And today I want to talk about a subject that hopefully makes us feel existential at the end of the next 20, 25 minutes of my speaking time here. How many of us in this room engage with agencies and creative agencies at a fairly regular level? Okay, I can see a whole host of hands being raised up. Uh, how many of us feel like, and I know it's a hard thing to raise your hand over here, but I feel like a whole host of times when I speak to my colleagues within the creative industry, and then when I speak to my clients, I see uh, Tata Click and Unilever and a whole host of amazing brands like Glance, all around, and many of them I've had the opportunity to work with, they often tell me that I feel my agency is so mediocre, and then I hear agencies and folks working within creative and account management tell me, I'm so tired of my clients, it feels like they're living in the stone age, they really don't know what they want, and you know, the fact of the matter is, mediocrity exists on both sides, and that is true. And, but I think within this room, for the next 20 minutes, if we feel that we could come together and get existential, if clients could influence the way their agencies and partners acted and behaved, we will live in a very, very different time. Now, I know that we are here to speak about emerging tech, and we are here to talk about AI. I feel a lot of people in this room are more qualified to speak on that subject, but I can talk about something that I believe to be true. As someone who represents the creative agency business, I see WPP, I see a whole host of agencies right here, Talented is one of them. I feel we are one of the most underpaid and undervalued industries. For everyone who works in marketing, I'm sure they've turned their agency over to the procurement team at some time or the other. You know exactly what I mean. I also believe that AI can write us out of the misery that we've written ourselves in. And I feel that will end the mediocrity that we see in the table all around us. The reasons why clients are suffering and agencies are suffering. And therefore, I want to start with one provocation. Why does any key opinion leader feel comfortable writing a clickbait that says the work that you and I do, our human creativity and human intelligence is absolutely replaceable, and AI can do it faster? How dare a journal write an article that talks about, look at all of these industries, Winter has come for them, and you know, they need to find ways to upskill, or you really don't know the path that you're down. I find it preposterous that anyone could believe that the work that we bring to the table is truly replaceable, but I also feel that the reason that has happened is because we have given them the opportunity, historically, to undervalue us. And I feel that AI can save us and sort of rewrite this plot but we can't talk about how to rewrite a plot without engaging a little bit with history. So this is a session where I'm going to digress a fair bit, but I promise to come to and make my point by the end of it. So I can't do this without talking about one of my favorite authors. His name is David Graeber, and he's written this book called Bullshit Jobs. Now, Bullshit Jobs is terrifyingly true. Big part of Bullshit Jobs talks about to anyone who would rather be doing something useful with themselves. Now, the way he, this basically started a massive intellectual debate in 2013 when this essay was first published. So to him, any job is a bullshit job if at any point of time you feel that this job in itself is unnecessary, fairly pernicious, and I don't think that it actually serves any justice. So any form of employment that's unnecessary or pernicious, that even the employee can't justify its existence, is a bullshit job. Now David goes to far lengths to say that bullshit jobs are different from shit jobs. Shit jobs have shit pay. Shit jobs, maybe I have to deal with a whole host of indignities because of the nature of the job. He's not talking about shit jobs. He also goes a fair mile to ensure that no one feels offended and says that I'm no one to pass moral judgment on what is productive work and what is a bullshit job. But if you yourself believe that this job was actually unnecessary, I could have used my time better, then perhaps it is a bullshit job. Very interestingly, if any of us 
have found ourselves indulging in a task that felt pointless, pursuing a metric because someone within the team, it could be a client, it could be a boss, asked us to, something like a chief of awesomeness quotient that we know really doesn't add up to anything. Chances are that's a bullshit job. Wasteful meetings make us feel like we have bullshit jobs, right? Now that is the fact of it. So it made me wonder a little bit about how do we, why do we feel that we have bullshit jobs? Now Bloomberg's done a research, 40% of marketers believe that their job is bullshit in some sense. I don't mean to cast a gloomy spell here. I wake up every morning feeling fairly energized for the work that I get the opportunity to do. But whoever hooted out there, I feel that they, re I think at some point we feel like, yes, the part of this job was truly bullshit. I wish I wasn't in this wasteful meeting. And it's ironic because we are an industry that lets to, that gets to participate in discourse. We get to be in rooms we don't belong. We get to influence massive decisions. And yet we believe that 40% of our colleagues believe that our job is bullshit. If you, like me, feel energized by your work, you know that in so many ways you are the exception, you're not the norm. Because most marketing rooms feel like I would be doing anything else with my time but this. But hey, here we are on yet another call, yet another meeting that could be an email, right? But that makes me wonder, no wonder we are also the industry that has the most expansive vocabulary around burnout existential crisis, unhappiness. Why does that happen? Funnily enough, burnout has nothing to do with long hours of working. Burnout happens, that's one of the reasons, but primarily it tends to happen when I feel that the work that I'm doing in itself doesn't have true meaning and impact. I feel existential when I feel that the work that I'm doing does not align with my core values and how I see the world. Unhappiness happens and we want to retire at 40. Nothing wrong with that plan. But it usually comes from a sense of, I really want to escape the misery that is my job. And these long hours where I'm pursuing awesomeness quotients. Which also makes me wonder a little bit that if Gen AI is truly so transformational, then why are we still doing bullshit jobs? I was walking in here at Tech Munch and the number of people who are still taking calls, the number of people who are still stuck in meetings and responding to emails. If AI is so transformational, why are we busier than ever? Shouldn't it have taken over our jobs? That's most certainly not happened, right? Now, I've already digressed so much, so let me digress a little more. I feel in every society, the reason that doesn't happen is because no ruling class wants educated people to have a ton of free time. That's gonna make them think. That's just not good for society. No wonder technology has always marshaled us to do more than we would have done. So in 1930, the economist John Mayard Keynes he predicted that by the end of the century, technology would have advanced. This is 1930, mind you. It would have advanced so much that developed mature markets like the UK and Great Britain would have achieved a 15-hour work week. We are more prime than ever with Gen AI and all the predictive modeling and everything that we've hear been hearing over today to have a 15-hour work week. Yet that is never going to happen because, like I was saying, Technology has always been marshaled to make us work more. But in the making us work more that technology has done, it has given birth to jobs that have most aspects that end up feeling like bullshit aspects of the job because we are chasing things that we don't want to chase. For the first time, this could mean amazing news because if we play our cards right, we can really define the kind of work we truly want to do with the advent of AI. But we can't change the course of history without engaging with history. Everything feels unprecedented when we haven't engaged with history, right? So here's a quick history lesson for a lot of the clients. Uh, maybe you can bring this as a bit of trivia to your agency partners. For all the agency heads here, this is a way for you to ensure you're finally priced right. And I feel when you are priced right, both sides will be happier because they will get better quality work. So technically, I'm a creative more than being founding partner and I will all, like I'll die a creative. Interestingly, I learned that creative agencies, creativity in itself has never been a price commodity. So right from the like history of the rise of creative agencies, it was basically a 10% commission cut to the overall media budget. 
something happened in the 1970s and 80s. So creativity, the reason why we feel like our minds and our creativity is in price is primarily because it was never priced. We used all our creativity in pursuing and reinventing things. We never used our creativity for the business model itself. So interestingly, something happened in the 1970s, 1980s-ish. Um, the oil and gas industry was going through a really hard time. Um, Shell Oil was at that point of time in Ogilvy's roster and um, they wanted to find a way to retain this really amazing client that got the big bucks. So David Ogilvy went up to Shell Oil and said, listen, we want to retain you. We know you're going through a really hard time. So at this point of time, don't pay us by commission. Why don't you instead pay us on the back of the actual time that the agency spends in being involved in your work. And that gave rise to an hourly based, headcount based system of pricing. Now obviously, if all of our creativity is going to come down an idea of what is the headcount? What are the number of hours that you spend working on my profile? There is no real incentive for automation. There's no real incentive to integrate AI into your workflow at all because I'm based on the number of hours. I'm not driven by the need to show more efficiency. And therefore, AI is something that I'm worried because I think that it is a threat. We are the ones who monetize the internet. All of us within who work in marketing, we are the reason why Meta and Google make their billions, and yet we fear that we will be replaced. I find that absolutely ludicrous that we wrote ourselves to this point in history. This is what the average scope of work looks like. It's so ridiculous, 20 social media posts, five paid advertising creatives, Facebook ads, Instagram ads. This is not what we bring to the table. Obviously, when I read something like this, I feel like, sure, AI can replace me entirely, and it can take my job, but this is not what we bring to the table. The value we place on ourselves is always going to be the values others place on us. AI can't substitute human creativity. We believe that AI can substitute it because we've let everyone see us, see us through this ridiculous education execution based lens. If you're going to see me and the price I put on myself is, hey, five social media creators, five sets of paid ads, of course I'm going to think AI is a threat. But that's not what I bring to the table. SOWs need to look like this. Tell me your real problems and let me come up with solutions. Solutions that only the human mind is capable of. And AI then just becomes a creative adjunct to what it really can be. So tomorrow when you speak to a client and a client says, hey, but X number of posts, clients aren't looking for that either. They're looking for real value. Agencies want to deliver real value. It just feels like there's a vocabulary gap in the way we've engaged so far and done business so far. Our jobs are not this, make sure the words are correct, uh, spelled correctly, make sure we buy the right spot at the right time at the right price, make sure the CTA button is on the right website. I'm sorry, I'm going to take five more minutes and I promise that I will come to the end of this really long monologue. This is our job, transform businesses by seeing connections and patterns that no one else can see. But. And this is my last provocation. I'm going to skip a big part of this deck so that it doesn't blare again. What about the people? I think the biggest provocation that I had, what about the people who actually are doing the bullshit jobs? And I'm using bullshit jobs only by David Graver's definition. I don't mean it myself. What if there is a consulting agency out there where your bread and butter is the bullshit aspect of the work? You have, don't we have a moral obligation to them as an industry? This reminds me again of my friend, John Maynard Keynes and what he said, which is, so there was this point when John Maynard Keynes, the economist said, at any point of time when a country is in economic stasis, dig trenches beyond war. Call everyone in the population, give them a shovel, tell them to dig a trench, then tell them to fill up the trench. What's going to happen is everyone will be employed, everyone will have a job, and your economy will go back to feeling invigorated again, because these people will give back to the industry, to the economy, when they earn, right? But I feel that doesn't apply to us, because I don't think anyone entered marketing wanting to do bullshit work. 
they entered marketing to have radical ideas they got siloed into bullshit work because of the conditions that we created so if we are thought leaders over here it's our responsibility to let them do their lives best work we've not given them the permission to do that so far we are not an industry made up of passengers waiting to get by that's just not our make we wouldn't be doing this there are 100 other things to do we need to remember that great ideas are truly rare and in a marketing landscape where distribution and productivity is commoditized this is going to be a truly scarce resource that's always going to be on the rise i had a few case studies for you that i'm going to skip primarily because i think we know what great work with ai looks like can you help me move forward nahi play karna hai so instead of moving towards the end of this presentation making a sense of the time here's what i want to bring up as my final provocation i won't play case studies because i think we have a fairly expansive vocabulary on what great work with ai could look like tons of global case studies out there but it is this either we can continue being subservient to ai we can consider ai to be a threat we can go down the path of employee headcount based pricing models that are our based no real incentive for us to reject things and what will end up happening then is ai will do the creation ai will do the thinking and all of us here will be subservient to it and we will be the ones who ensures that this is what ai created let me check if it plays end to end and we will be ai checkers and we will be auditors for the beautiful work that ai gets to make or from this moment on we say that don't you cannot value me on the basis of an execution lens what i bring to the table is the beauty of human intelligence and creativity ai is always going to be a creative adjunct and when we do that for the first time ever all bullshit aspects of our job could come to an end thank you so much for staying with me as i digressed Thank you.